in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's webcast. Today, we have a wonderful presentation for you so you can learn about strategic program design. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, enter them into that question box there, and we'll, we'll get to those during the Q&A portion. The webcast is being recorded, and we will send a link to the recording as well as the PowerPoint as soon as they're available. If you'd like to follow along, you can download the handout in the handout pane there. It's a PDF document. And we typically have a pretty active Twitter discussion. If you'd like to follow the Twitter chat, the hashtag is WCET Webcast. We have quite a bit of content to get through today. We'll do brief introductions to the panelists talk about what is strategic program design, or SPD, how does it work, hear from one of the institutions about their story, and then we'll get to your Q&A. Again, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, enter them into the question box. If you have comments, you can add them to the chat box. And we'll jump right into it. Today's moderator is Mike Garn, who is the Assistant Vice Chancellor for New Learning Models at the University of System, Georgia. Mike leads college and system redesign, development, and deployment of new instructional and educational operation models for the University System of Georgia. He has a very vast background in higher education and is a longtime WCET supporter. So please take it from here, Mike. Thank you, Megan, and welcome everybody to uh, what I think is going to be a really fun day here. We're going to be learning about how to analyze trends in the market and understand where the educational gaps and opportunities exist, not just for students, but also to help students prepare for jobs. So uh, I think the, the folks you're going to hear from today have got some real interesting things to talk about and I'm sure you want to get to them. We're going to have uh, presentations by David Kapranos, then Stephen Slodowski, and then Jordan Hathaway. As Megan said, we'll be walking through what this is all about, how those things work on campus, and how you get people interested in it uh, and work with this. So at the end, we will have questions. As Megan said, there's room up there to put questions in. Uh, as you were going along so that uh, if you're like me, you don't want to forget them. They're, they'll be up there and ask, and we'll work through those when we get to the Q&A part. So without any further ado, I'm going to move it right along to David. And David, introduce yourself to the wonderful group of people out here. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mike. Um, David here from Wiley Education Services. I head up our market strategy and research department. Uh, we can go ahead and to the next slide, I guess, guys, if you want to do that. So we thought it would be important to um, start off first, number one, by thanking Mike for uh, for introducing us and hosting us today, and then thank you also WCET um, for, for hosting this conversation. I want to start off talking a little bit about who Wiley is. Uh, we're a global education leader, uh, been around for about 200 years. A lot of you will be familiar with us from our uh, textbook publishing. Um, even publishing the dummies novel, uh, the dummies book, that sort of thing. Um, in many ways, we're a learning business, uh, a business that's here to help universities, societies, corporations to develop skills and knowledge uh, they need to um, to achieve their full potential. So Wiley Education Services is a core business unit um, within Wiley. We were formerly called Dell Tech. You might be familiar with us um, from those days. Uh, we deliver on on a on a simple mission, mission, a critical mission. It's one where we were there to help our partners achieve success, further their mission in an increasingly competitive and dynamic market. Um, so our service capabilities were born out of um, an online program management business model, but in many ways we've we've grown beyond that, uh, moving more and more into uh, strategic institutional partners um, with a number of our partners, providing different solutions architecture to help them better meet the needs of their students and, and their universities. Um, in many ways, we seek to be a uh, not just a vendor, but more of a partner with our institutions. And, and what I think is important to understand there is that we're in, often in a learning role with them, and we, we observe a lot from the market and understand uh, a lot of our uh, comments today, a lot of our um, the perspective that we're going to bring to the table is through working with this, this larger partner network. So um, 
where do our insights come from? And like I said, you know, um, it's, it's that 20 years of experience that we've had in the online program management uh, community. We represent over 40 institutional partners and, and uh, support over 250 individual online programs in the market today. Um, a lot of our data in our department is also going to come from iPads, um, from other classic market research tools like the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. Um, we look at uh, just general observations and trends in the market as well. So one of the things, or the thing that we wanted to talk about today was strategic portfolio development. And, and what we've noticed out in the market is that there are typically two, two main paths towards putting together an online portfolio. On the one side, um, you've got this organic portfolio development where in many ways there's a general call for interest on campus um, and a number of programs that are, that are quote unquote ready to go online are the ones that go online first. What you usually end up seeing here is um, a number of unrelated programs. You very rarely see shared courses. It's generally inefficient. Um, and because of that, there's, there's a limited market reach. On the other side, um, what we've observed and, and what we've coached towards, too, with a number of our partners is more of a strategic um, approach to portfolio development. And what we mean by this is having clusters of related programs, uh, many shared classes, and, and ensuring a broader market reach through this type of design. So on the organic side, when we see this kind of unrelated uh, mix of programs, what we usually end up with are a lot of missed opportunities. There's a lot of uh, potential students that are attracted into the school that they may not be able to find the right program fit for themselves. Generally speaking, it's more inefficient because there's very few shared classes. Um, and what we see sometimes is programs are, are cut and, and kind of fail before they're able to reach their full potential. On the strategic side, when we think about laying out our programs in an organized way, uh, you get a lot more efficiency. There's, um, we'll talk in the next slide about a more of a mo modular approach to program design um, that allows you to tap into a, a lot broader of a market and in turn end up strengthening your program offerings and then resulting in more students. So Mike, we can go ahead and, and uh, skip forward to the following slide. And what we're going to see here is generally um, the, the model that we typically talk about with our institutions. And if you follow me from the working from the left to right, what we usually advocate for is to start with large anchor programs. And these types of programs are going to be the ones that, that we all think about when we generally think of graduate level education. So things like MBAs, um, Master of Science in Nursing degrees, public health, public administration, and that sort of thing. Starting with these programs, uh, we advocate for thinking about differentiating those programs through concentrations. These are packages of classes um, that, that can be used to differentiate a degree. So you can think of your um, MBA having something like a supply chain management concentration. What that does is it, in effect, um, grows the potential audience that you're able to capture. But thinking about that package of classes as a, as a, a module, what we can do is spin that off and have it into related programs like a master's in supply chain management. Another classic one would be an accounting degree. So you may have your accounting degree, your MBA, and then you'll have shared classes in between where you'd have an MBA with a, a concentration in accounting. Another thing we advocate for often with using thinking about these classes as, as um, discrete modules where we can spin them off, we offer, uh, a number of our partners will offer certificate programs. And these certificate programs will entice a broader audience. What we've noticed from a lot of students and with student, um, a lot of survey results have given us has shown us that students are very interested in um, skills-oriented education. You know, they want things that'll prep, prep them for the job world, that sort of thing. And thinking through your content in a modular way allows you to quickly pivot, pivot and address these markets. Um, we've observed in the marketplace too. There's there's three big trends when it comes to how students come into a degree, and, and this type of modular program design will address that. So typically, there's the, the traditional graduate student who's in for you know their, their 10 to 12 class program and, and, and looking for something like an MBA or a degree along those lines. But we've noticed there's a, an audience that is often overlooked, and it's more of a gateway audience, an audience that's looking to try their um, you know try out the waters with online education. Maybe they only want a smaller package of classes, something like a certificate or a nano credential. Um, and then often what we've found is many of those students will um, be converted into a full graduate degree. There's an additional audience that a lot of universities don't necessarily cater to, and that's more of an, an enrichment audience. These are folks that may already have um, the sufficient level of education. They may already have their master's degree, but they're looking to pivot into new areas of their career, new specializations, that sort of thing. And offering content available to them as well is something that can really grow your audience. So ultimately, 
Um, it's through that modular strategic portfolio development where you're able to pivot to these new markets and then in turn um, address uh, you know new challenges as they come across. So lastly, we want to talk about the the impact of this type of thinking, and you can go to the next slide for me there, Mike or Megan. Um, when we talk to our institutional partners, uh, essentially a lot of the challenges that they face bucket into these four general buckets. There's these operational issues, uh, kind of the challenge with an increasingly savvy um, customer base. There's delivery and, and measurement challenges and then financial challenges. And we think this approach to strategic portfolio development can help with all of these. So on the operational side, there's obviously a much more efficient use of resources because you have a lot of shared classes that are being used. So there's better student-teacher ratios. As far as the increasingly savvy consumer, um, like I said before, a lot of our students are looking for skills-oriented education and having a modular content that you can quickly bring up and bring to market. Having those certificates, those kind of smaller investments for students allows you to cater to those students in a better way. Delivery management or measurement challenges, uh, really providing that engaging um, market-relevant skills-based content to the market will, will help with retention. Uh, it's also something where, from the faculty side, we see that they're able to engage and bring more interesting course content to the market uh, in, a, in a smaller module rather than supporting maybe an entire degree. Uh, leveraging the portfolio in that way can really help to address and, and pivot to these new markets. And lastly, of course, you know, one of the, the big challenges with a lot of institutions is there's declining enrollment, declining giving, in giving and endowments, things along those lines. And what this allows you to do is leverage your um, your capital, I guess, in the best way where you'd be able to address the, the best audience for, for your investment dollar. So in a nutshell, that that's, that's what we're advocating for here today is, is really thinking through using leveraging market research, looking at your local market, understanding uh, what's attractive to that market, what, what has the largest chance of success, starting with that, and then advocating for, for nuance and, and, and more niche program design to follow and be supported uh, within the structure that was um, highlighted in the previous slide. So, so that wraps up my time. Um, next up, we're going to have uh, one of our faculty fellows, um, Steve, talk a little, he comes from the University of Scranton, talk a little bit about how this has played out um, in our partnership with them. Thank you, David. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Steve Sadlowski. I'm an associate professor at the University of Scranton. Uh, over the last eight years, I've had the privilege to work in four uh, distinct online programs. And what I'm going to talk about today is some of the uh, our portfolio itself and then give you some opportunities and, and challenges that we've faced. We always like to talk about theory to practice, and David did an excellent job talking about the theory. And what I'm about to speak to you about is what we've done here on our, on our uh, campus. Next slide, please. So we started out at the University of Scranton. We had core residential-based programs, but shifted about eight years ago um, in offering an online MBA program. That was the first online MBA program or online program here at the University of Scranton. And what we found is that the consumer, as it was shifting, was looking for more online education. Shortly after the MBA was offered online, we moved into an online human resources program. We were finding that the residential-based HR program in our regional mid-Atlantic market was saturated. And in order to sustain the program, we really needed to move in an online direction. And therefore, the Master of Science in Human Resources program was developed uh, with the support of Wiley. The, it's important to note that the lessons learned from the MBA program going online were used in developing and executing the HR program online. With the successes of both the MBA and MHA, we moved into the Master of Health Administration program, um, which I'm proud to announce were the largest CAMI accredited program um, in the country as of two weeks ago, which was reported out. And so we found that, again, the consumer, in particular for the adult learners in graduate education, there was a need for graduate MHA program, primarily focusing on accreditation. And then the fourth program, which is distinct, which is fairly new, came out 
about a year ago as a Master of Science in Health Informatics. It's important to note as we look at the University of Scranton strategic portfolio that you'll notice on this slide that we've, we've, we've identified some critical success factors that we feel are important for sustaining um, the programs. That being from the MBA side is the specializations, and I'll talk a little bit about the benefits of offering these specializations as it relates to the inter-college and interdepartmental collaboration. But we've been able to offer a specialization in human resources and healthcare management. Uh, in addition, with the Kenya School of Management, we offer two certificate programs, supply chain management and enterprise resource planning. You'll notice that both for the MBA and as I move over to the College of Professional Studies, that we rely heavily on, from a market positioning perspective, the accreditation. Uh, the MBA program is AACSB accredited, and we were one of the first MHA programs that were CAMI accredited, which is the Commission on Accreditation for Health Man Management Education. The piece that we looked at for human resources, although there was no accreditation body, the Society for Human Resource Management did offer a body of knowledge, and if you were aligned with that body of knowledge and can indicate and show through evidence that your curriculum met that body of knowledge, that SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management, would recognize you as SHRM aligned, and we were able to obtain that. Within the last month, SHRM just released their competency movement as, as the MHA has, has done, so we're moving in that direction. One, one of the things that we felt was also important, I'll talk about this a little bit later on, is how do we position ourselves in the market uh, in terms of, of, of pricing, and, and we, we looked at credit reduction um, in the human resource program. And then finally is the Master of Science in Health Informatics program, which is uh, really the an interdisciplinary program where it relies upon faculty um, from three different colleges on campus, from the business school, from the College of Professional Studies, and then also from the College of Arts and Sciences as it relates to computer science. Next slide, please. So what were some of the factors that led to the University of Scranton strategic portfolio. Um, one is pricing. Uh, one of the things that we found that, that was limiting our market development, in particular for residential programs, was the unwillingness of individuals to relocate and be on a campus, um, A. B, the credit, the, the price per credit um, we saw as a significant barrier in the future um, for obtaining, you know, the enrollments that we anticipated. And so in some of our thinking is, well, how do we limit the increases in pricing per credit, or how do we at least, um, or, or can we reduce the pricing per credit, and what are some strategies to do that, and, you'll, and, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, job outlook. <clears throat> One of the things that we felt was critical, as I know we all do, is what are the trends in terms of job employment post-graduation? Where are the projections for the next 10, 15, 20 years? What we were able to capitalize on looking at these job outlooks were some of these degrees that had similar um, niche markets. For example, a CFO for a large health system that one would argue that an MBA is most appropriate but they do need to have some healthcare management background and experience. And so we looked at developing the specialization in the MBA program for healthcare management. And that was all driven off these job outlooks and job prospects given the industry changes. So the outcomes, one of the things that we always look at, as most programs do, is the job placement rates, employment rates, retention rates, etc. Things that we report out to our accrediting bodies, um, both program specific and regionally accredited specific. So that becomes extremely important in identifying what are the key programs in our portfolio that we feel are most appropriate. And so some of the trends in the industry have shaped 
some of the specializations and certificates that are being offered. So it's this whole idea of getting ahead of the curve and trying to anticipate and project out what specific value added specializations or degree elements would help us stand out or position us market wise a little bit above our com competition. And so that becomes important. One example is this whole movement in healthcare, um, in global health, that in the US we need to be extremely sensitive to public health, uh, infectious disease as it relates to transportation and the, the amount of commu the communication and transportation cross borders. And so what we're proposing, and it's being hopefully approved in curriculum, is a specialization in global health. It's important to note here, as I'll get to the next slide, that, concentr that specialization in global health are courses that are being offered to not only MHA students, but we can get a cross-discipline student into those courses where we have MBA students, MHA students, HR students in a single section. And we found that to, to really develop these economies of scale and try to try to reduce um, the cost per, per course offering. And I think that's where really these efficiencies and programs come. I can tell you right now, I'm teaching a class, a healthcare finance class. It's a class that's core. It's one of the foundation courses for our MHA program online and in person and residential. But it's also one of the requirements for the specialization in the MBA program. And so what you have in a course of 20 is perhaps 10 MBA students and 10 MHA students. So what, what you're getting here is the synergy effects, not only of, of the, the, the uh, operational efficiencies in terms of the, the offering of a course and getting those seats filled, but you're also getting the learning experience where you're getting divergent skills, viewpoints where the learning in the classroom, in my opinion, often exceeds where you would have, instead of just having a, a cohort of 20 nurses in a, in a class, you might have four nurses getting their MHA. You might have five accountants getting their MBA. You might have, and so on. And so that learning becomes extremely important. And these are some of the areas that we, we, we really thought through strategically in terms of how are we going to be offering and what should we be offering in terms of our strategic portfolio. Next slide, please. So the effects of the portfolio, synergy, and we would say considerations here, but of course when we talk about theory it seems fairly, you know, logical and reasonable to expect that offerings be delivered and 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 students are going to enroll and, and we'll, we'll all be happy. Uh, the reality is there's some significant considerations from an application and implementation perspective that need to be addressed. And that being one, accreditation. We know that, for example, MB, or the MBA program has AACSB. We know that the MHA program has CAMI accreditation. The standards to some degree overlap, I would say between 70 and 80 percent, but there's also that other 20 to 30 percent where we need to make sure that courses being offered in the business school that count for an MHA course um, are meeting the same competencies that we say that our students are attaining uh, from the MHA side. So, so that is a critical area that we really need to be concerned about that we're still maintaining program specific accreditation when students are taking courses in other departments and other colleges. A second consideration, cross-departmental faculty collaboration. I think many of you perhaps experienced, I could tell you for sure I have in my career, uh, that there are turf wars that relate to certain content in areas that are being taught. I'll give you a prime example. In our human resources degree, our Master of Science in Human Resources degree, we offer 39 credits being proposed um, to 30, uh, 33 credits at this point, but we're offering courses specific to human resources, one being an overview of human resource management. Well, in the MBA program, 
they have their faculty teaching a human resource survey course as well. So how do we develop collegiality and professional collaboration when somebody may be, in the eyes of some faculty, taking a course away from them? And so that's a significant challenge. And I think that's where organizational culture on campus um, and communication across departments and support from deans and the provost um, become extremely important. Um, so that, that becomes important. And the third area here is the visibility and location of the program. So the argument always comes up, should the human resource degree be in a college of professional studies or should it be in the business school? Should health informatics, right now it's currently housed here in the nursing department. Some have argued, well, should that be in the business school? Should that be in the health administration department? Should that be in the computer science department? And so from a market sensitivity uh, perspective is, well, where are students looking for those type of degrees? Where would a student go to look for a health informatics degree? Is it the nursing department? Is it the business school? Is it the health administration department? So there are some serious considerations, I think, that really need to be thoroughly thought through and the groundwork done before getting into some of these cross-listing of courses, which is an opportunity here, as you can see. One of the things that we felt um, and experienced in terms of cutting the cost of tuition, you hear that across the country, that there's this increased pressure on the cost of education and how do we become more efficient in our academic models. Um, and I can tell you from the practice world, from the business world, you know, in my experience of 15 years being in hospitals and physician practices and doing some international consulting work, real estate, we're always looking at that. We're always looking for efficiencies. So from an academic perspective, how do we do that? <clears throat> I mentioned students taking a specific course from various degrees. I can tell you, for example, right now we're offering a... Um, a health systems course. It's a survey course of the healthcare system, and we have occupational therapists in that class filling those seats. We have business school students filling those seats, and we also have uh, health administration students filling those seats. It gives you the opportunity to support low enrolling courses that may have seven, eight students that are just specific for MBA, and then to bump that up and capitalize and maximize the, um, the, the uh, course load and course seats. The other opportunity that I think is extremely important that we found when we look at some of these portfolio effects, we just offered and developed this MBA MHA program. And we found in the first five months, six students that said, wow, that would be great for me and I wanna sign up for that. So basically what we're looking at doing here, and it has already been approved through curriculum, is taking the two curriculum for the MBA and MHA, the MHA being 53 odd credits, the MBA being 39 credits, which you know is, is close to 90 credits, the consolidated dual degree is down to 70 credits. And so what you look at is similar courses, such as the org behavior course in the MBA program and the org behavior course in the MHA program, and sitting down with program directors and faculty to say these are similar content areas. And so we'll substitute this course in for another. There's, in my mind, there's no additional fixed cost. There's the, the variable cost would be potentially offering another section of a course. But if you think about it, a student that says, yes, I will take the MHA, the dual degree, and they're in the MBA program, the university now just generated a 39 credit producing program up to a, a combined 70 credit producing program. This synergy came out of the strategic portfolio. And then the final opportunity here is to look at these accelerated programs. What we're finding, and I've saw significant increases in the last two years, uh, we get between 10 and 12 students that are undergraduate students that in their senior year can take up to 12 graduate courses that count for undergraduate requirements and also support and count towards their graduate program. And so we have that. We have students in biology and accounting, in um, health admin and HR that, that, that 
roll right into an online graduate program, and we're going to be seeing more of that coming in the near future. A lot of opportunity here for that. Again, cross-discipline, cross-college, where we have undergrad biology getting into a college of professional studies. Again, generating new credit hours, not necessarily adding new faculty lines, but just filling seats. Um, next slide, please. So I'd like to turn it over at this point to Jordan Hathaway. Hi everyone, this is Jordan Hathaway from Wiley Education Services. I'm focused on marketing efficacy and performance management as well as the standardization of uh, best practices across our 40 partnerships. So I'll round out today's conversation with shifting it into how this all relates to marketing. The approach of strategic portfolio development really influences marketing in two main ways. First, we have the university's value story in the marketplace. And then the second way is the economic benefit to the overall marketing budget. So let's start with first unpacking how a university builds its value story. We can go on to the next slide. On the top here, we have things like history, mission, credentials. These are the sort of long established macro level brand ingredients that we all know about. And then the value story is further made up by factors that are rapidly evolving. We have program differentiation, we have the outcomes of those, we have the online environment, faculty, so forth. So where does strategic portfolio development come into all of this? In effect, it helps the school become really a center of excellence and a set of very scalable disciplines. In turn, what this does is help build competitive differentiation. So now the marketer in me, of course, has to give us an acronym, so I'm going to say SPD. <laughs> While uh, SPD here has a lot of great internal benefits for this school, it's also a really student-centric approach. I like to say that it's, um, it's the intersection of institutional competency and today's student journey. When an institution can market a depth of experience that gives the students meaningful choices, the value story really grows in the marketplaces. You start to see students themselves perpetuate this value story in forums and blogs and as they converse with one another in all the different channels in which they do. We all know that marketing messages are most meaningful if it's arrived at from the student's perspective. Long gone are the days where we're using course catalog descriptions to sufficiently describe a program, and gone are the days of the online modality being unique. As Stephen talked about and David did as well, students are very point blank asking for the outcomes and the ROI of today's uh, program. They want to know specifically the competencies that they're going to walk away with and how the ability of the program is going to deliver on that. So if there's a set of related choices that can better speak to all these individual nuanced needs of a particular career chosen path, it really helps build the, the student confidence. And something else that Steve just talked about that sort of reminded me, there's also a comfort in knowing that there's a depth of different choices that a student can go into if the first choice can be augmented or maybe doesn't hit it out of the gate. Just knowing that there are different options to choose from that are all uh, related and, and available is very helpful as the student navigates which one is right for them. All right, so let's move on uh, to the way that it impacts the efficiency and the overall scale of a marketing budget. Next slide, please. All right, so sometimes there's this assumption that every single graduate student knows exactly which program they want to pursue. We know at the undergrad level that we're, we're very confident in knowing that students um, are unclear or unsure about which program they want, but this happens at the graduate level as well. The reality is many of the initial searches that are higher up in the funnel are very broad. Students will start looking for program comparisons. Um, this often leads to uncovering a specialization a certificate, or even a completely different program that the student had no idea existed. So let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean by that. Uh, I was recently looking at a search index that compared the terms accounting masters, accounting MBA, and business masters. So those three terms, one's very specific, 
uh, one's, one's broad. So on average, there's 76% more searches for the brand term business masters than searches for something like accounting masters. And now that's a bit intuitive, right? Now the phrase accounting masters has 147% more searches than typing in the phrase accounting MBA. But let's imagine that the school could compete with any one of these phrases. That's exactly what happens with SPD if there's a program suite that can be co-marketed together. Even if it's completely messy internally, as Steve very eloquently talked about, the realities of that, um, there is incredible strength if these marketing uh, choices can be done together, irrespective of the internal uh, makeup. So the other thing is, instead of building all these one-off marketing assets that support just a single program, you can consolidate. The great impact with that is speed to market. So if I think about speed to market, it's a lot quicker when we can add tangential options into an, eco, uh, an existing set of assets and marketing campaigns rather than completely starting from scratch. So say we had a set of landing pages or a website that was already built that was focused on business programs, it's a lot easier to insert uh, a certificate, a specialization, and so forth into that ecosystem that already has most of the faculty or some of the other key value propositions than, say, starting, you know, starting completely over. Now, from a media perspective, digital marketing efforts can be initially targeted to a larger audience, which generally re uh, results in a lower cost for inquiry. So with that, let me give um, an example using Scranton. So we can market an ad like the University of Scranton business programs, find which one is right for you, something like that. That cost per inquiry is going to be less expensive than a highly competitive phrase like online MBA. But if an MBA was all they had, then we'd be limited to that narrow approach. And if the only other online program was, say, a nursing master's, then it wouldn't make sense to co-market and I lose the efficiency from a media standpoint. So in Scranton's real world portfolio example that they have today, we can market at the individual program level, so say something like MBA with an accounting specialization, but we can bring down our cost in aggregate for the school by marketing the suite at large. So that's where you get into marketing things like business programs. So from there, the market demand is going to dictate how the inquiries actually shake out by program. Now, at Wiley, we underpin all of this strategy with sophisticated media technology that allows for performance targeting and conversion modeling. That's a webinar for a different day. But what I want to illustrate here is that um, time and time again, as we look at our metrics internally and across our partnership, what David and Stephen have talked about um, really resonate with the marketplace. It really resonates with the internal logistics. And from a marketing and efficacy standpoint, it stretches the dollar. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Mike, I believe, for some maybe questions. All right. Thank you very much, Jordan, uh, Steve, and uh, David. Much appreciated. David, I'm going to give you a heads up. Uh, I, I'm thinking maybe uh, you'd like to do just a little bit of a summary for us uh, of what we've heard and where you think that ends us up. But uh, we got a couple of things first. Uh, first of all, for you folks paying attention, I'll bump my audio up just a little bit so you know something's going on. And uh, we got handouts over in the handout box. So check those out. Those will be important. Also, Steve, we, uh, we have a message from Elizabeth Chibachi, I think it is, uh, who's a Scranton alumni. So, you know, hello. Great. We're, we're, we're touching lives out there. Uh, we also have a question in here on market research. So, Jordan, I think this goes off to you. What kind of, the question is, what tools do you use that include burning glass, other types of tools? Yeah, so I'll, I'll field that one, um, Mike. I, I head up the market strategy and research department here. Uh, so we use a number of tools. Um, 
the bulk of our data is going to come from anyone that does higher ed um, market research, does a lot of work in iPads. Um, obviously, there's a lot of time spent there. Uh, we look at a lot of classic um, market research tools like the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. We do a lot with Google Analytics and a number of other tools to look at, um, at you know, traffic on the web, that sort of thing. Uh, lastly, we do look, we do use Burning Glass. They're a, um, what they are is a uh, labor market intelligence tool. Essentially, they look at job posting data. And what they do is they, they index that data and allow us to query against it so that we can look at things like what are the actual skills that are being requested by employers. Um, so in many ways, it ends up being a listening tool for us uh, and, and for Jordan's team as well, where we can, we can speak to the audience in the same way that their potential employers would. Uh, and then in turn, kind of connecting it back to the school will tell Steve, hey, these are the things that, that we hear in the marketplace. Can you help us understand where this is highlighted in your current curriculum? How can we communicate and share that value story back to the student? Um, so yeah, those are, that's an example of some of the tools that we use. Uh, thanks for the question. All right, very good. And David, could you pick up on, on this, kind of give us a little bit of a summary of uh, the gestalt of what we've heard here today. How should someone listening to the, everything you folks have been talking about, what should they be thinking about doing next? Well, I think really, uh, you know, engaging multiple, um, you know, stakeholders within an institution is obviously a critical first step. Understanding um, what is uh, available and ready to go is something that, like I said before, a lot of our institutional partners will start with. But I think stepping back and saying, what, the, what would be best in the marketplace? And then really, uh, you know, seeking to, to put forward that narrative and, and that as a, a goal and a mission is, is what we think is really critical. Understanding um, what makes your particular institution unique and then understanding how that fits in your um, ecosystem. So whether that ecosystem is, you know, the driving distance around campus or whether it's broader than that, uh, but really understanding how your institution can connect with that and how you can do that in a way that um, is really going to connect with the audience in a strategic way and then building accordingly uh, is, is really critical um, to moving forward. All right, thank you very much. I want to let people know we've got the opportunity uh, to get some expertise and experience here. We've heard some good information, uh, but I'm sure you've got a couple of questions out there. Don't wait for someone else to ask it. Uh, go ahead and get your questions in. Uh, Jordan, while we're waiting for the next question to come in, could you maybe give me a more specific example of how you've marketed two different programs to the same audience? I know you've talked about the MBA and the MHA. How do you help a student with decision making between those? Well, that is a, that's an excellent question and one that we spend a tremendous amount of time internally thinking about and working with the institution to craft the answers on that. And one of the ways I can give us a specific example of how it culminates is with um, something like an infographic. And I'll take the example you just gave, MHA, MBA. We have an infographic that says, which online health degree is right for me? And it has positions MHA or MBA, and it takes you down a decision tree. It's going to ask things like, which best describes you? Are you a clinician? Are you a business professional? Maybe I'm non-clinical, healthcare professional. And through that, it's going to take you through an entire decision tree that's going to disseminate information that's most suitable, again, for the student who's going through this journey. One of the things I find very interesting is that if you were to type in a program name, and you know today Google starts predicting what they think you are about to search for, one of the things you'll often see if you put uh, the degree name, the next thing is going to say versus. So it's going to say VS. And you'll immediately see, uh, if somebody types in MBA, they're positioning it against three or four other programs that they're trying to get smart on it. So if you offer, if an institution actually offers both of those programs, what an incredible opportunity to capture the interest of both consideration sets and lead the student to the program that's right for them. Okay, terrific. I like that. Uh, Steve? Got a question for you. You you had talked about the importance of accreditation uh, in marketing this and, and getting the the sense of quality and what uh, students are looking for. 
can you talk a little bit about the synergies uh, that the, the portfolio development helps you achieve? Uh, does that help you achieve some significant cost savings? And can that be a, another competitive advantage that you can use? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. What we've experienced is when you can reduce the increase the number of students in a section and reduce the number of independent sections that are siloed with discipline specific courses you have the leverage to be able to reduce some of the or at least advocate to higher administration to compete on price more that we can lower perhaps the price per tuition because that variable cost is is somewhat minimal and so we've experienced that we've actually been successful just recently uh, with, with our HR program to be able to get um, a price freeze and actually a reduction in the price per credit um, again that's in in kind of response to the market and where that specific degree is at nationally and globally uh, but we felt that with our efficiencies that have been created uh, it does give us that extra margin to be able to, to, to work on price. And so that's, that becomes extremely critical. So I imagine you, you mentioned the administrative buy-in. I imagine that's a, a critical part because we know administrators are always concerned about the bottom line. Are there other strategies that are effective in, in working with your administrators, getting their, their support and buy-in on, on this? Well, one of the things that we always like to start with, and, and uh, David mentioned this, is the market research uh, to show where the trends are going, what students are looking for, the changing adult learner uh, in terms of what specific skill sets and competencies that they're looking for. So if you could convince them that we need to move on this, and if we don't move on this, we're going to be losing market share. And, and so as you can show trending data, what we track is our enrollment numbers and if they've flattened out um, or even fall uh, and begin to see some drop off you know we feel that you know at some level it's a little bit too late and so we've been able to show that that certain changes to curriculum as long as it's still meeting the accreditation and curriculum requirements um, are useful in terms of uh, maintaining our our numbers and enrollment so I, I think showing the evidence is, is, is extremely important, showing the market research and uh, what's happening with our competitors. And the other thing that I, that I find extremely important is attending your professional meetings. So discipline specific, what are your colleagues uh, doing in terms of their strategy and their portfolios and where are they moving? And so in getting that collegial information and then sharing that with administration to say, hey, look, Here's what X university is doing, Y university is doing, and Z university is doing. If we don't move quick, we're going to be behind the eight ball here. And I think that's the type of information that becomes important. And if you could show them the, the stabilization or decline in revenue, you know, they're, they're going to start to get concerned. So I think that becomes important. All right. Uh, so Steve got another question uh, here uh, asking how you deal with the uh, the internal financial model uh, really uh, that the so that there aren't any disincentive disincentives for collaborative program offerings across units uh, you talked about kind of that turf wars area there okay so, so your question is around the strategies related to um, how to engage in inter-college um, collaboration? Well, the, the internal uh, the kind of fiscal models that you use to make sure that uh, everybody's, uh, you're, you're okay. developing a win-win situation across units at the campus. Okay, that, yeah, that's a good question. So, so for sure, one of the things that, and we just had a meeting about this several months ago, but one of the things that becomes important is the program offering the section, the actual course offering, and the seats in that course are tagged with that revenue and the credits being generated um, out of that specific college. Um, and of course, that could cause some controversy. And so what we find important is balancing the offerings between colleges. 
Um, so I can just tell you, not specifically, but just off the top of my head here, um, I can tell you that the, um, uh, the College of Professional Studies here does offer probably, you know, four to five courses where MBA students are taking, um, taking courses in our program. And in the MBA program, if we looked at the new dual degree, we have several MHA students from this college taking courses in the business school and they get credited for those revenue dollars being generated. So I think there needs to be transparency around the um, cost designation as it relates to the specific instructor teaching and then the revenue being ger generated by the college. I can give you an example. Um, I'm teaching a course for the MBA program. The MBA program out of their college pays for that overload or pays for that percentage of cost, but they also get the revenue associated with that with that uh, you know generation. And same in the the College of Professional Studies. But transparency becomes important. And then creating this culture of of this this is to support the mission of the university proper as a whole that we need to make these market changes, uh, in particular in online education as we're moving in that direction, specifically for graduate school. So if we, you know, you almost get the point across, if we don't do this, we're all in trouble. And so that becomes important. All right. Steve, I have a question here from Valerie uh, Kelly. And it's, it's kind of a two part. Uh, I think the larger question is, does accreditation get in the way of being able to take these uh, programs to scale. And the second part of that uh, is, were you able to use subject matter experts as instructors uh, in your AACSB accredited MBA program? Okay. So so the, uh, the, the second one, let me answer because that's a little bit easier. Uh, the, the response is yes. We're very clear in terms of the ratios and qualifications for what AACSB requires in terms of subject matter experts. And then same on the CAMI side for, for health administration. Um, in fact, I, I can tell you, now this is going back, geez, about six, seven years ago when our site team came in and they said, okay, you have an individual teaching your, your health economics and policy course, but they really don't have the, the, the academic preparation nor the professional practical applied experience to be able to teach this, you need to make some modifications to that and bring in some of that expert um, subject matter expertise. And so we ended up bridging with one of our sister institutions down at Georgetown, another Jesuit institution, a, a colleague that was able to co-teach certain sections, or I'm sorry, certain portions of the health economics course, who happens to be a health economic, econ, economist, to be able to address those topical areas. Because here in Scranton, Pennsylvania, there are no health economists. And so we're very diligent in terms of who's teaching what courses. And um, so, so that becomes important. The, the first question in terms of the accreditation issues, it becomes clear that, for example, the MBA program, AACSB accredited, their specialization in healthcare management does not bring with it the CAMI accreditation. Um, so, so we have an AACSB accredited MBA program with a specialization in healthcare management, um, whereas over in the MHA, we're dealing with the CAMI accreditation. But it's a really good question, really important question, because it, 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 it gets to the point of, in conjunction with subject matter expert, how can we ensure that a course that's being offered in the MBA program or vice versa is meeting the other program specific needs for competency adopted education, their competency model and meeting those needs. And so one of the strategies that we've done is to is where we have the faculty from the different colleges meet and say, look, you're teaching this course, you're teaching the org behavior course in the business school for a substitute for our MHA course. Here are the competencies that we say students get in our MHA course. 
can you embed and bridge that into your course and make sure that we're meeting those? And then fortunately, we've had faculty on both sides that say, okay, well, let me adapt my course and my assignments to bring in some, some hospital or behavior case studies and some other, um, you know, um, you know, course specific activities that can meet those, those criteria. But that's a really important question, really something to consider when looking at these cross-discipline uh, course offerings. And Steve, we've got about 30 seconds here for an answer on are there particular barriers uh, in the accreditation from either that, that help or that make it difficult to go to scale? We have not really experienced any other than the validation, as was just asked, the validation to make sure that the program directors get the faculty that are the subject matter experts teaching those specific competencies and content areas. Um, that, to some degree, is a challenge, but we've been able to overcome it to recruit either adjunct faculty or get a full-time faculty in modifying their what they're teaching in the classroom. So I, I would say that that's probably the biggest consideration. And then the final one is, is with accreditation, as we know, showing that the faculty teaching are doing their research and bringing that research back into the classroom. All right. All right, Steve, thank you very much. Steve, David, and Jordan, uh, greatly appreciate your time and bringing some great information to us. Uh, thank you to all our questioners and participants. And Megan, I now return the helm to you. Great, thank you, and thank you, Mike. Wonderful job as moderator, as always, and thank you to our wonderful panelists. Great questions posed from the audience. If you're new to WCET, visit our website. We have a lot of wonderful resources that are posted on our website, including our new resource guides, which compile some of our wonderful questions and answers from our very popular listserv discussion. That's where you can find out more about any of our events. and. The webcast will be posted, the recording to the webcast will be posted on our website. You'll also receive a link via email. Our upcoming events, we have a leadership summit on essential institutional capacities to lead innovation June 14th through the 15th in Salt Lake City. Registration is open for that now. And we are accepting call for or excuse me, proposals from members and non-member organizations interested in sharing what they're doing at their institution with technology enhanced education. So the call for proposals is open. The deadline for that is Friday, May 4th, so you, or excuse me, May 5th, so you do have time to get your proposal submitted. Thank you to our supporting members and our very generous sponsors that underwrite our programs and events. Our next webcast, which isn't posted yet, but stay tuned, is on May 18th, and it's a look at unique programs that are evaluating and giving credit for learning that takes place out of the classroom. So stay tuned for that message. So again, thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you on the next webcast. Bye, all.